about nanobiophotonics. Now don't worry if that phrase doesn't mean anything to you because the people I work with in the physics department quite often don't have a clue what it means. Oh, okay. But before I get stuck in, can you have a guess at what nanobiophotonics means? Nano is small. Well done. That's very <laughs> Sorry, I took the easy one. Oh, damn. <laughs> it involves light. Yeah, well done, yes. To bio uh, like biology, so something You've done more it. now with yeah. that little bit of um, <laughs> deductive reasoning than a lot of my colleagues have managed to do at Coffee Turner. <laughs> What's that? Nanobiophotonics. Is that physics or are you a biologist? It's like, well, actually, it's both. Um, so yes, yeah, small, 10 to the minus 9 metres, that's the nanometre, and biologically to do with photonics. So I'm going to break it down into what light is, um, and what causes colour, and colour in nature. Mm -hmm. Because nanobiophotonics is concerned with imaging, manipulating, and characterising biological samples. And that is quite a broad field, as you can probably imagine. Have you guys ever used microscopes before? Yeah, that's time. Yeah, it's a light microscope. So I do multi-photon imaging and spectral ana analysis using microscopes. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to talk to you about that. I'm going to talk to you about something rather perverse I used to do with butterflies. Perverse? Yes. <laughs> well, I think it's a little bit perverse. Okay, so basically, you've heard of light being thought of as a wave before. Do you know a wave of what? This is not a trivial question. What is it a wave of? Photon. Well, it is, but it's, it can be thought of as like a probability wave. Because when you think about a wave like in the sea, what's actually moving is the particles in the ocean. And although light is a photon, it's a particle, um, thinking of it in terms of a wave, nothing is actually being wobbled, as it, as it were. Um, but we're going to think of it in terms of a wave rather than a particle today, because that simplifies things somewhat. Now you've seen the prism experiment before, where you can break up white light into its um, component colours using a prism. And I've got a diffraction grating here. I don't know if um, it comes out very well on the camera. So this grating um, is kind of similar to what a prism does, except that this has uh, very, very small lines made in it. And uh, so this is illustrating that light interacting with small structures can have an interesting effect in terms of colour. I'm not going to go into the theory of it too much, but um, if you want to take a look at the universe through a diffraction grating, it's quite psychedelic. <laughs> it's quite fun. So that's demonstrating that when light interacts with small things, interesting stuff happens colour-wise. Um, so you've seen one of these charts before at school. Uh, so you've got the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's very, very small compared to the whole range. So we've got all the way down to radio waves, all the way up to gamma rays. Um, so the wavelengths that we're looking at um, are sort of like a few hundred nanometers, basically. So it's quite small structures. So in order for this um, to interact with light in this, the way that it does, we've got 600 lines per millimeter. So it's very, very, very small grating. So we know that, for instance, this top is yellow because of the way the light interacts with the molecules that make up this. We dye it to change it, to make it different colours. And it absorbs some colours and reflects others, and that's what makes it yellow, and that's what makes this green. But um, absorption and scattering in that way isn't all that gives colour. As I've just described, structure clears colour. So why do you think a bubble, a soap bubble, gives beautiful, first of all, um, quite bright colours, and second of all, why does it change? Why does it shimmer? We did have... The light is falling on the bubble structure. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. to do with the structure of the bubble. So um, the, the thickness of the bubble skin determines the colour that you get out. So some light will fall on the surface of the bubble, and some will travel through to the bottom surface. And the bottom surface light will reflect back up through, and the waves will interfere with each other, and some colours will cancel out and other colours will add. So it's the thickness of the bubble skin that determines the colour. So as the bubble, um, the thickness of it is moving and slightly changing with the wind and temperature, that will change the colour, and that's why it changes. And that's why in this one you can see dark spots here, that's because the thickness has uh, decreased to the point where you can't get the current effect anymore. There are other ways that you can get light. These are naturally occurring fluorescent dyes, or fluorescent ores. I got this image from Wikipedia, and it's my back, backdrop on my computer. Um, so these are an another example of colourful structures. But I'm going to talk to you about beetles. Now, here are some really beautiful insects. Oh, I've wow. got this, as with most, many things in life, I got these from eBay. So this is an example of the beautiful structures, uh, beautiful colours that you can get from nanostructures. Um, from nature. So each of these has a different nanostructure on it. Now the surface of beetles is um, made of a protein called chitin and this is very very lightweight but very very strong and we scientists who are looking to industrial applications for example you've heard of self-cleaning glass 
um, or you might not have done actually. Self-cleaning glass is a, a structure on, on the surface of glass which um, enables dirt to be lifted off when rain falls on it. That idea for that came from the coating on a plant. So we're always looking to nature and interesting optical structures in nature to kind of mimic them and, and to use for our own technology. Hmm. But there's one type of beetle called the rose chafer, this little chap here. And the, his surface is very remarkable in that the green colour is circularly polarised light. Now, you've probably been to the cinema and um, seen 3D films recently. I just need to check this is the right way up. And, yeah, so, if you hold this, this is a polarising filter. And if you hold it in front of the beetle and rotate it, can you see the green colour changing to brown? It can be difficult in intense sunlight to see this. Yeah, I can. Kind of. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah? yeah. It might be easier if you try it yourself. Try it yourself. Okay. Uh, if it's hard to see, the left image has not been um, manipulated anyway. The right hand image is taken through a circular What are you polarizer. rotating? You can just rotate the whole thing. Oh, right, that's what you're doing. Oh, right, okay. Well. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's quite remarkable that the structures on that surface reflect light in a way that's circularly polarised. This is a little schematic diagram. So the electromagnetic um, field, so the electric and magnetic components, 90 degrees out of phase, which gives a vector that rotates in space. And this is left-hand polarised light. And the structure on the surface, if you zoom in using the electron microscope, zooming into 50 microns, 10, 15 and 10, but this is under, um, this is with the filter and without the filter, so it's green or brown. And this kind of surface is what people in biophotonics sometimes look at with industrial applications in mind. So have you got any questions about these fascinating little critters? So this, this beetle is green? Yes. Because it, Or is it? Is it, yeah. <laughs> It's, because it's green because the light has been shining on it for so long? Or why it's is green it? because of the structure, the way the light interacts with the surface. Okay. In the same way that the bubble is coloured because of the thickness of the, of the surface of it. So then why is this one orange? And mm, well, the, the way that beetles see each other is very different to how we see them. Bees, for instance, can see ultraviolet light, so the way they see plants is very different to how we see them. Now, there's lots of different reasons why beetles have such vivid colours. Sometimes it's camouflage, other times it's a warning if they carry a poison, and sometimes it's to attract a mate, because the most ridiculously large and attractive beetles are obviously going to be very visible to the predators. And if they can fend off predators in spite of being ridiculously large and flamboyant, that shows they must be quite strong. There's lots of different... Kind of so they've got reasons. some. So, so you said this was made of chitin. So, have, are they made of different things to give them those different colours? Well, structural colour isn't the whole story. There are also pigments within, uh, like butterflies, for instance. The scales on butterfly wings. If you've ever touched a butterfly and had them the, the kind of powder come on your fingers, that can partly be pigmentation and partly be structure. But these, the structural protein for all insects is the same. It's all chitin, okay. and it's very similar to what you get in shellfish. That's called chitosan. Mm -hmm. And these are all very interesting biopolymers. We've been using chitosan as a, as a <coughs> drug, uh, kind of polymer to, to dissolve drugs within the body. So, yes. You can take one of these out if you want to have a look at the underside. I think a, a leg has fallen off this one. Yeah. <laughs> they, they do I think get, it's dead, it's fine. <laughs> He's not going to need it. <laughs> but these ones yeah, don't be, exhibit the cyclically polarised light phenomenon. So if I looked ones. at this, would it change? No, no. no, those ones. It's only that particular structure that gives that. And it's quite remarkable in nature to have this, which is why it's, um, it's quite a high impact factor publication. <laughs> right, so how am I doing for time? My, my stopwatch actually stopped halfway through. <laughs> so do you have any more questions? Um, applications of this kind of technology? Well, Apart um, from movies. You can scale up nanoscale structures to look at um, the interaction with microwaves. That's one group in, in the physics department has been looking at. And metamaterials is one application. <laughs> so trying to make um, weird interactions. They're trying to make objects appear to be invisible once you've got them in, surrounded by a metamaterial. Um, it's only for one particular wavelength, but ultimately the application could be like stealth applications. Um, but yeah, nanoscale structures can be scaled up to look at other wavelengths, which is a lot easier to experiment with. Trying to um, recreate this structure is a bit of a pain. I use butterflies with a kind of a nano pillar structure in order to use surface enhanced Raman scattering. Because if you coat them with metal, it really amplifies a particular um, spectroscopic technique that I was using. So I did it for protein sensing.
there's so many different types of applications. You can also use it for cosmetics industries and cars, car coatings, you know, paints with iridescent colours like this. Um, that's one application. There's, there's just so many. Fibres, uh, coatings for optical um, components in laser experiments and, um, like I said, uh, self-cleaning glass. Yeah. And there's so many. There's so many. <laughs> So uh, keep your eyes peeled for the next insect. I will. Uh, awesome. <laughs> I always want to trot on them straight away, but maybe <laughs> I won't. <laughs> so if, you, if you're interested, you can buy it like this box that I got off eBay. Yeah, very very yeah. They're very pretty. They're set in resin, so I can give these to school children without worrying about the meeting. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Very good. Well, thanks for your attention. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.